Thank you. Handing back to Reva Ji now. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the fifth in our series, uh, Educating for Justice Through Peace. You're going to have a wonderful, wonderful webinar this morning. And uh, today is also the uh, first day of the season for nonviolence. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Catherine, who will be our host today. And please enjoy. Thank you so much, Reva. And I would just ask John Majay if he could share my slides. I think Ria will be doing that. Ria, can you? Oh, oh Ria's I'm here. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> I'm oh, thank you so much. <laughs> So welcome to Critical Pedagogy of the Imagination, drawing us together, the fourth episode of a six-part series exploring educating for justice through peace. My name is Catherine Winkler, and I'm honored to facilitate today's webinar focusing on art as a critical uh, practice for nonviolent transformation. Welcome to all of you, and thank you to the entire Jai Jagat team and their ongoing dedication to the global campaign for justice and peace rooted in the thought and the practice of Gandhiji. 
after the global peace march from Delhi to Geneva was suspended in Armenia, the campaign continues developing actions and conversations for justice. So let me begin. So I don't know if we can go to the second slide, Ria, that would be great. Thank you. And if the, the show is on play, then we can do one at a time. But it's lovely the way it is too, thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, so, so let me begin by expressing gratitude. These webinars are the effort of an international team of educators and activists coordinated with loving skill and determination by Dr. Reva Joshi, who you've just met, who has chaired weekly meetings. And I want to thank Anna, a student at Principal Arif Ibrahim's school in Alberta for the artwork on the poster, for Ria who designed it, and for all of her technical support. I'd also like to thank the Saharia artist whose painting of Ekta Parishad Satyagraha hangs behind me. These girls attended the Kasturba Gandhi Ashram School in Shiopur, Maharashtra. So the first slide, the beadwork. I'd like to acknowledge that I am in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, a territory covered by the 1725 Treaties of Peace and Friendship. This painting is by Christy Belcour. It depicts floral patterns inspired by Métis and First Nations historical beadwork. Belcour's work often focuses on questions around identity, culture, place, and divisions within communities. Please share your territory, your city, or your region in the chat if you can. The next slide is the slide is Indigenous Worli art from Maharashtra. It honors the everyday activities in a tribal community. Now in Zoom, our geographies are collapsed and we reach to the visual, whether in film, textiles, Instagram, photography, or art, not only in solace, but also to inspire and to spark our imagination. Art can bring joy. And the next slide is here in my neighborhood on my morning walks. I often encounter the Canada mail truck sporting a pop art humor. Art draws our attention, alerts us, appreciates difference, and accompanies our daily lives. In the next slide. On the next slide, you can see that art speaks to us of our suffering and our longing of war and of peace. Art makes history of oppression visible. On the next slide. And on the next slide, Vikram's cartoon. It, art continues to tell the story of injustice in a universal language. The next two slides, please. It is always just around the corner. Our anguish and love is made visible through the creativity and the imagination that can be revealed through many medias, drawing, painting, photography, film, installation, and performance, to name just a few. The next slide is of Gandhi. As we listen to our four presenters today, sharing their practice of making, painting, and film, we do so one day after the anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's death, marking the beginning of the season of nonviolence, as Riva mentioned, reminding us about the transformative power of nonviolence. The season was established by Arun Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, as a yearly event celebrating the philosophical lie and the lives of Mohandas Gandhi and Martin Luther King. The next slide has a quote by an art educator. <laughs> there are many instances of images of the possible calling attention to what is lacking that break through the boundaries laid down by the taken for granted. So we imagine Ahimsa together. So a heartful welcome to our guests and all of you attending today. And thank you for the technical support again, Ria in India and to Annie Luke, who will be helping us in the Q&A. For the format this morning, we'll have our four presenters giving 20 minute presentations We'll collect any questions in the chat, so please feel free to put any questions in at any time. And then after a brief musical interlude, we'll have the Q&A, 
and then we'll, we'll end with closing remarks. So let me introduce our first panelist this morning, Janma J. Singh, one of the participants in the Jai Jagat March. He has worked with cinema, fiction, and documentary as director, editor, and occasionally cinematographer for a variety of projects in India. I actually don't have a lot of biographical material, but I did a little research and found a quote on the Jai Jagat site. So if you don't mind, Jay, I'll read it. Armed with the words and experiences of the people from forests, villages, and towns, men and women are marching to solve the greatest problem humankind has faced. They march with conversations, songs, prayers, slogans, and chai. The question we seek to answer to an answer to is how can we solve problems of the world without whacking each other to bits? Art exercises the muscles of our imagination to lead us to the solutions. John Majay, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I think for me, as one of the Padyatris, the foot marchers of the Jai Jagat Global Peace Campaign, um, I think that has actually been my biggest exercise and project in terms of um, nonviolent filmmaking and nonviolent storytelling. I've worked with um, other nonviolent forces before. I've worked with monks, uh, Tibetan monks, and non Tibetan Indian monks, and so on and on. But uh, I think my biggest learning was as a part of Jai Jagat, where I was faced with the challenge, and I was not alone in the challenge, luckily, but I was faced with the challenge of trying to put together the story of a march that was going on across five, six different places at the same time. Uh, there were small marches happening in Nepal, in different parts of India. And then there was this one big march which was happening all the way from Delhi uh, to Sevagram and then in different parts of the country. And I think what I uh, understood was that to encapsulate a movement like Jai Jagat, I would have to uh, A, be there full time. So I requested uh, Jill Behan and she very graciously agreed to let me be a part of the march itself. And the second thing which I required was to understand how such a march works because it's the people who make these movements work. Um, as uh, Catherine has already given a beautiful introduction of uh, the process of uh, nonviolent storytelling, I'd like to probably just build on that with a couple of examples. Uh, I'll do a couple of examples from uh, photos that we might be familiar with. This is a photo called Migrant Mother, which is uh, an iconic photo, which led to a huge change. Uh, the photographer who captured this was walk, uh, traveling and this was in the US and um, they wanted, uh, the government had requested actually photographers to take photos to highlight the situation of migrant workers in the US. The migrant challenge is also a challenge we face in India. And this photo was instrumental in uh, pushing a lot of US policy towards, uh, you know, uh, identifying the people who were in need of help and to then divert that attention to them. This photo is again an iconic photo of Sharbat Gula, um, the Afghan girl as she is well known. This photo was taken in the 90s and this became a representative of the devastation uh, due to war in Afghanistan. These are just a couple of examples that show the impact of just one image uh, on the greater scale. Um, another example, I mean, there are lots of examples actually, but uh, another example could be the documentary An Inconvenient Truth. 
uh, I don't think we have time to show the trailer or anything, but uh, this documentary was made by Al Gore and it was instrumental in uh, bringing to attention the climate crisis being faced by the world. It was a worldwide documentary and through all of these uh, uh, different forms of art, we bring awareness. And through awareness, we uh, try to reach out and uh, influence people in certain ways. So um, again, going back to Jai Jagat, I think what was important for me was that I was uh, learning from the people that we were marching with because I come from a decently good background. I don't have um, challenges of poverty, of uh, not having a place to live in, of having my land taken away, or uh, people trying to invade into my personal space or into my life and dignity. But I'm somebody who has the resources to document what is happening and to present that. And I think through this uh, documentation and presentation, I would, uh, I've been trying to address the challenges. Uh, Catherine, if you could tell me how much time I have left. I'm sorry, I don't want to go over. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little heads up. I'm actually um, thinking maybe about uh, five more minutes or so. 10, 10 minutes. I'm good with five, I think. Uh, I agree tell you, so a lot of my work is visual rather than uh, conversational. So I think it would be uh, interesting if I could interact and have a discussion rather than just give a presentation. I mean, I can keep talking, I keep talking regardless. Uh, but I think it's important to uh, discuss a movement or an action through uh, activities. I am more of somebody who does things. So I'll just show a minute or so of this music video. I'll show the entire music video during the break. But this is a music video that I had made for Jai Jagat. So I'll just show the first minute and um, elaborate on the process of storytelling for Jajakat because that is my latest project and my ongoing project.
sorry i'm uh, well i'll go back and show the entire video again uh, in the break but i just wanted to show this uh, excerpt from it to explain uh, the process of nonviolent storytelling this song was uh, a gift that was given to us we did not expect uh, the song to be performed uh, by our friends but this was sung by uh, well one of the people who was walking with us in armenia agabek it was sung by his sister serbohi and it was a surprise gift from her even agabek did not know that she had memorized the song because she could not speak uh, hindi but she learned the song to perform it for us in her own style and for us that was a very important part of our journey in armenia because in armenia we had walked uh, actually uh, we reached armenia around 10 days 12 days from now uh, last year so it was the middle of winter it was very cold uh, and we were walking through very uh, arid landscapes through very small villages through uh, the temperature was constantly in negative uh, it might actually not be a very unfamiliar weather for our friends in canada but for our friends from the tribal villages of india they have never seen snow so for them suddenly to walk in the middle of this entire snow capped mountains and um in the middle of snowfall was a very uh, unique and a very challenging experience so far it was important to document the challenges of walking the processes of walking and the interactions because uh, as we would see in the second half of this music video we interacted with a lot of people we stayed in schools and every day we would go and meet the kids and we were surprised by the number of people who knew about gandhi they knew about mahatma gandhi they occasionally knew about indira and rajiv gandhi but for them the values of non violence and peace is were very important and they were ingrained and the kids were very excited to come meet us they were very fond of um uh, bollywood that was a very important example of the soft power of india because they would uh, come and they would start singing this song called jimmy jimmy um which is a very popular song from india way back in the 90s and they would sing the song called avara hu which goes back to the 60s but uh they still remember india through that and they would come up with posters which say hind ka stan sirum m hayastan which means india loves armenia and armenia loves india so uh through art we would uh come together and that was the beauty of filming this experience because it was not being filmed or uh captured as um something from a third person's point of view but from somebody who was right in there and feeling and experiencing every step of the journey so it was a very interesting process um there were other friends with us they were uh, in india we had a documentary filmmaker called varun uh, in india and armenia we had a friend called shabaz satish these were people who were uh walking with us filming there was this one time when shabaz had hurt his leg he had sprained it and um there was another time when he had i think cut his foot and it, there was some bleeding but he would um uh, put on a tape and then he would run ahead of the people who were walking just so he could get the camera shot because there was a beautiful visual so uh for us the beauty of the movement the beauty of working with such incredible amazing people gives us the energy to go that extra mile and try to tell the stories that we want to tell and well that is the process of non violent transformation for us thank you so much jamna j you've brought the, you've brought the march to us in a way through the medium and 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 through what you've shared in your words and this is the beauty of the image 
that it, it transcends. So thank you so much. And there will be questions for you <laughs> in the Q&A. Thank you. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our next panelist, our second panelist this morning, Zigrid Rahman, a PhD candidate in the Educational Leadership Program uh, and Policy Program and the Comparative International Development Education uh, Collaborative Program at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education in Canada. Her principal teaching and research area concentrates on education and political violence and conflict, intervention, prevention, and social change and related fields. She is also a visual artist. More recently, her work explores and examines the embodiment and shifting perspectives of peace, violence, and human connection. Welcome, Zigrid. Thank you. Hi, Catherine. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, Jen Majay, for your for your amazing presentation. Um, I don't know if you can uh, see our slides, my slides. Um, but yeah, as you can probably gather, um, I'm sort of an academic by profession, but I always say that I'm an artist at heart and by nature. Um, and Thank you so much for having me here. I will talk a little bit about paintings and visual arts. Um, I dabble in photography as well. So it's interesting that Jen Majay showed some of the pictures and sort of the influence of picture-based arts. Um, Ria, could I see the, could you put my slides up please? You want me to present it? You want me to present the pictures? Yeah, I yeah. sent you. I'll just slides. do it. Yes, I'll just do it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, probably you can just start off. My internet is a little lagging, so I'll just you can start off and I'll immediately okay, start. Perfect. Pressing. So yeah. for those you probably you won't see this, but um, I started with a quote by Pablo Picasso, and he said, and I quote, "I painted all my life like Raphael, so that one day I could paint again like a child." And I thought this was a very um, appropriate quote, despite my mixed feelings about the man, um, because pedagogies of imagination, in my opinion, is a lot about the ability to lose yourself in art. And I come with the idea that the urge to create is strong in all of us, despite you know, various doubts, um, either personal or societal. And so I think, we need to start um, looking at art through the idea that we need to eliminate the idea of right way to do things, um, especially in the arts. As a teacher, because I always te I also teach, um, how many times have you heard, oh, I can't draw for the life of me, right? And so I think it's imagination here that counts and not necessarily skill. Um, those education, we most certainly can equip students to have certain skills that will foster that imagination. And perhaps you can switch to the second. Uh, thank you, yeah. So this is a painting of mine. It's a bit of an older one, but as you can see, I put some, some words and if you wanna put down words in the chat box about what you see art as or what it represents for you, that would be great and I'll add them after. But it, it really is about representation of peace and, and violence in art. I think war is much represented in violence. Um, and that is a problem because peace means something different to each of uh, individual. Um, and part of the Jajagat is trying to bring people together to envision what that peace might be. And as educators, we need to give both kids and adults alike sort of a an envisioned stage of what peace might be. Uh, but in order to do that, they must first understand art and understand the messages that art um, gives it audience, really. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily just uh, refer to traditional, more classical art, like the painting that I have behind me, uh, which is one of my favorite paintings but it can be other types of visual arts. And perhaps you can switch to the next one. Next slide, please, Ria. 
So as you can see, I have here some pictures of magazines and I think most or, or um, uh, war drawings. And I think most people wouldn't necessarily look at these and think of them as art. But the truth is, is that we need to transcend what we think of art and a, a, accept all forms of expression. And I think these are the ones that really bombard our students, right? We, we see paintings, for example, which is what I do, I'm a painter. But at the same time, there's so many more visuals that um, exist around our students. And so from a pedagogical point of view, it is important for us to look at the potentials of arts, um, both its positive and its negative sides. Um, so I think what I want to bring to you is the idea of visual literacy. And I think Janma Jay sort of implicitly touched upon it, right? When they when he presented the, the two photographs and sort of the impact that it had on, on various people. But really as teachers, you can actually actively look at these things um, and not only give them context to them, but give students both the skill and the freedom to look at it, interpret it, understand it, and then sort of ask them to take it forward, right? Um, and it, it really, a lot of the visual arts that surround us is a reflection of the time in which we live in. Um, so perhaps I thought it would be very interesting and maybe I can have the cooperation <laughs> of the panelists. I, I created a little exercise um, on slide five, Ria, if you can put it up. Um, on deconstructing art. So that's one of the things where, even if you have students who are not creators of art, you have viewers, right? You have consumers of art. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be an artist to appreciate art or to understand art or to see the impact it has on both the self and a society level, right? So one exercise that you, you could do with your students, for example, is to take a look at various types of visual arts and try to understand how to deconstruct them and see the kind of impact it has on them and then talk about the various sort of, I guess, levels would be um, uh, where the impact goes. So I have a couple of, of prompts, right? Like, for example, if you look at the picture of the New York Times magazine, which was sort of released um, last year, actually, I think it was October, if I'm not mistaken, it writes there. If you eliminate the wording, right, and you focus on the visual, what does it say? What is your first impression? How does it impact you? What is your feeling, right? Where does your gaze go, right? If you uh, hide uh, the words, what stands out to you and what is the message that it is trying to say and how did the words play off of the visual, right? Um, have you seen this type of iconography before, right? Like you have the, the cars, for example, you have certain colors, how do you accentuate them? And in a sense, this is also part of sort of media deconstruction, but it is so closely intertwined with art and art baits because visuals, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, so really looking at art from a critical point of view um, and not just a critical, but also from an emotional point of view, right? Because art has a very a powerful impact, whether negative or positive. So I thought perhaps we could do like a two, three minutes if anyone or any of the palinists would like to comment on the picture using the prompts. And then we can have a larger conversation in the Q&A or if you have any questions. And then once we talk a little bit about that, I can talk about nurturing some of the artistic practices. So more geared towards both viewers, but also um, students who want to be creators of art. I know that's. Did you want us to speak, Sigrid, or did you want us to write uh, the panelists? Did you want the panelists to write in the chat? Well, you can write in the chat and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the comments that I see. I already see that. Um, one comment, it says, I see space, mental, emotional aspects being taken up by the unnecessary things, cars, monotonous thoughts, right? I think about overpopulation, 
Right. So a lot of the the it seems to me that the gaze does go to, towards the cars, for example, right, and sort of the clutterness of the cars. And to give you a little context, um, chaos, claustrophobia, right? My eyes follow up and down and over and over again. Um, and it's true. But and if as a teacher or as an educator, um, you may be a teacher to K to 12 or as an educator towards adults, it really doesn't matter. I think both kids and adults need uh, more visual literacy um, because I think it's sort of, I would say, people think it is automatic that you understand the artwork and the visuals that surround you, but that's not necessarily true. Um, yeah, and so I think all the space has been preoccupied. So it, there it does seem to be a focus on the fact that it's very cluttered, right? And so the context of this picture, for example, in particular, is that um, this is after COVID hit and the unemployment went up. So the cars were not on the streets anymore. They were parked because people lost their jobs and were at home, right? And so what does New York Times really wanna say to us? It says, well, we're together, right? And that is just my interpretation. So I think one of, again, to sort of circle it back to my main point, it was that we cannot, um, limit ourselves into how we think about art and we can be both creators as well as consumers or viewers of art. Um, but at the basis of all of that is an understanding of art and arts based um, uh, visuals, right? And the elimination of the idea of right. But there is an idea of looking at the messages that art are trying to say, whether consciously or unconsciously, implicit or explicit. Right, and some of the things that I wanted to give you guys, because it is sort of a pedagogy of imagination, so it is geared towards teachers or educators who might want to do this with their students, is some ideas of how you can nurture artistic practices. Um, myself, I've I've done art for as long as I've remembered, but I've never really uh, been a student of art. Like I've never taken up art in school, uh, which is interesting in itself, I think, because it took me a long time to come to the point where I even consider myself an artist. Um, but there are some artistic practices that any student can take up, whether they are ultimately a creator of art or not. For example, you can notice how you respond to art, right? You can have a class on looking at various um, arts-based stuff. For example, there you could take a look at um, classical paintings and understand, for example, the male gaze and how women are depicted in, in paintings. Or you can take a look at, as I said, some of the magazines that people and students see all the time and deconstruct them and try to understand what they mean and what the message is. You can have a conversation with a piece of art or an artist that you admire and you can look at the context in which the artist has created. You can get your hands dirty. And I think this is very important um, to get your hands dirty, put your hands into the paint, put your hands into a sculpture. Uh, you can draw your emotion, right? So art is both, it can both be damaging, but it can also be healing. And so I think the power of art comes with um, using art to create a nonviolent uh, self and in turn a nonviolent uh, community and global community. You can do narrative storyboards and look at how stories can be depicted in pictures or how are depicted in pictures, right? And I think I'll leave off with the main point, which is to say that um, art is more than the traditional classical, which I absolutely love. Um, don't get me wrong, that's not something that I want to put down. I'm a painter myself, but it can take many forms. It can be a design, it can be a magazine, paintings, film, photography, labels, logos, uh, book covers, album covers, the picture that you drew on a napkin. Um, and so expanding the idea of what, what art is and how you can interact with art should be, in my opinion, as both a painter, as an educator, as a uh, academic, 
it should be at the basis of everything because it is such a powerful way of expression and it is such an ubiquitous all over place art. Um, thank you so much for that. And I'll, I'll leave it here because there's a lot to talk about, but I just, as Gemma Jay said, I think I would prefer if we had a more conversational, collaborative, interactive um, session. <laughs> What a great idea. Thank you, Secret. Thank you so much. All these ideas are popping up just from going through that experience of your presentation, reaching deeper, going below the surface. And when you see those cars, what messages are we getting? Thank you so much. And we'll get back to you in the Q&A. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we're moving along to our, our third presentation. And I believe that you may need a scrap of paper or two or some or a pen. And um, if you would like to do the activity, uh, I think there is a, a moment where you can uh, have your status changed to panelists. So if you put your hand up in chat, I want to participate. We'll take the first 10 because I think this is a webinar format. Anyway, it has to do with the format, but let me get back to the introduction. <laughs> Our third panelist is artist Alejandra Barahona, known as Bara. Bara is an active artist, illustrator, and edu educator coming to us today from Guatemala. She specializes in characters inspired by her daily life and paints subjects that address questions regarding social interests, philosophy, and human behavior. Bara is the founder of El Nido Art Studio, exhibits her work around the globe and has an amazing number of followers on Facebook, including me now. Her, workshop, her workshops focus on women's empowerment through art. And I actually met her online uh, through the Cody Institute and enjoyed it so much. Art is a tool for change and Bada's life work is rooted in this understanding. So thank you Bada for joining us today and take it away. Thank you, Catherine, for that presentation. And I'm going to share, I don't know if you see me there. OK, there we are. <laughs> and thank you for the previous panelists. It has been a really interesting conversation there. I'm really happy to share my point of view on art. I'm going to share my presentation in one second. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about art as a tool for change. Uh, how to think outside the box, okay? Um, can I change this? Okay. And I am an artist from Guatemala, as Catherine said, and you can call me Ale or Bara, that's fine. And I'm an industrial designer, an artist, and a facilitator. And I wanna start uh, my presentation with this quote, which is, tell me and I forget, tell me, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn from Benjamin Franklin. And I think this is the basis of what I do. I think when we teach art, I'm an art teacher, facilitator of art, and we have to involve people, I think, in order for them to learn. This is the way I have learned. Art for me has been um, a really important tool in my life. It has helped me to overcome uh, different things like sadness, anger, anxiety, depression. And I want people to experience this as I have experienced it in my life. So I started uh, doing a series of workshops, designing workshops that can help people. So art for change. For me, art um, in my workshops, I teach how to overcome these things. I talk about women empowerment, personal development, problem solving and conflict resol resolution. And we have always been taught that art is subjective, right? That it depends on the viewer, it depends on your experience. And I think life is the same way. Life is subjective and they sometimes don't teach us this thing. They don't say life uh, is, you should see life your way. You know, everybody has a different way of seeing life. And I think art can teach us this. So we're gonna start uh, a little hands-on here. So if you have a little piece of paper, we're gonna start with the activities. The first activity I have um, is from concrete to abstract. And 
I'm gonna leave the presentation so you can see what I'm doing. So if you have a little piece of paper, you know, we're gonna cut, I hope you all have it there. I'm gonna start because I don't see you guys. So we're just gonna fold it. So we have a little like long side. We're gonna cut it okay. on the long side. Yes. If you have scissors, you can do it with scissors. If not, just uh, cut it with your hands. We don't need it to be perfect. Ali, do you want the, the other uh, participants to have their video on or off, or will you cue us when you want the videos on? Uh, yeah, it's however you want. If uh, you want to see all the works from the participants, we can do that. If not, it's fine. It would be nice to see what everybody's doing, though. So, what do you want? Okay, we're going to fold this in three parts, like a trifold, okay? In three parts. It doesn't matter if they're the same size, just fold it in three. We have three parts, okay? Three parts. And then we're going to fold it again, one part to the center, the other part to the center again. So I'm going to do it again, open it, fold it in three, one, the other side, two, then again, one, and then two. So we're left with a little square, okay? Fold it in the middle. I'm going to show you my screen now, okay? So we're get, what we're going to do now, you're, we're going to draw something in the middle. Whatever you want, it has to be something concrete, like a tree, like a car, an animal, whatever you want. And it has to be in the middle, so it passes both sides. So I'm gonna draw like a little rabbit here. And do some details. If you're doing an animal, maybe do the eyes, do the mouth, you know, the tail, doing a little rabbit there. So I have my rabbit and you know, it's gonna be in the middle, try to pass it through the middle. So when we open it, you know, it's in both sides. Okay, so something concrete, whatever you want, however you can draw, everybody can draw. So if you only can draw stick figures, just do stick figure, that's fine. No problem. Okay. Yeah, perfect, Catherine. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Yes, something concrete there. Good. Now, when you have it there, we're going to open it. Okay. And we're going to have one side, you know, one part in one side, the other part in the other side. Okay, good. So what is this teaching us, you know? When we have something concrete, this is like life. Sometimes we have a problem, sometimes we have a goal, and we see our goal and we see our problem in a certain way. But when we start addressing it, things are not as they seem, you know? Sometimes the problem uh, needs a different solution. So what do we want here? Now we're gonna to go to the abstract. Okay, we had something concrete, like a problem, like a goal. And then now we have, we, we're gonna do something abstract. So what we're, we're gonna do is we still wanna get from the top to the bottom. These parts are separate now. So our roads sometimes are gonna be longer. Sometimes we're gonna need, you know, to draw different lines to get from the beginning to the end. So just draw different lines so every part of your drawing meets somewhere. And keep doing lines. If you have a lot of details, just make those details. Go to one side, to another side. Go to the edge of the page. You know, just start doing lines. The important thing is that one line of your head or your, your beginning joins the other side, okay? 
and just do lines everywhere. So now we're doing something abstract. So we arrive, you know, to something really different from where we started. And this is the same as life. When we have a goal, we have a problem. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay. So as you can see, if you can see all the participants there, everybody did something different. Okay. So we're going to arrive to our solutions in a different way. It doesn't matter how we get, how we started, as long as we end it, as long as we arrive to the goal. It doesn't matter if the road or um, you know, our way gets longer. It doesn't matter if we pass through other paths. It doesn't matter. As long as we arrive to a solution, as we arrive to the goal, it's, it's gonna be okay. So sometimes we have to see things in a different way, in an abstract way. We have to deconstruct what we have learned in order to arrive to a solution, okay? That was the first exercise. We're gonna do more, but just wait a minute. I hope you liked it. And you can start putting in the comments if you like it, what you felt, what do you think about this exercise? Okay, I'm gonna continue with the presentation. So I don't know, let me see. Yeah, you can see it there. So this kind of exercise are really good, you know, to make people understand uh, that life can be seen in a different way. So this is another quote I really like. Everything we see is per perspective, not the truth. So, you know, it's something we have to deconstruct everything that we have learned in, in order to solve problems in a different way. Okay. Uh, so we're going back to talking a little bit more about art and how it can change people, how, it, how I use it in my life. I also use art in community development. I work in different projects, doing murals in different communities uh, in Guatemala and in, different, uh, in other countries. And what I have seen uh, through these, through working in, uh, with murals, with communities, I have seen that this has helped uh, people building teamwork, uh, unity, a sense of belonging, empowerment, self-worth and achievement. And I'm gonna show you some projects that I have done. So whenever we go into a community and work with murals, we usually start with a sketch and with a meaning. It has to have like a theme usually. Uh, then uh, with my team, we outline the mural and then we put everybody um, you know, in the community or whoever is working with us uh, to work, to paint together. So this is really a fun project because everybody gets involved and you're doing it in a community. So people from the community are painting the mural with us. Uh, this, was a, this was a project uh, we did in Spain and this was a really challenging project because we did it with uh, six year olds to 17 year olds and we work with spray cans. So imagine a six-year-old with a spray can. It was a little chaos, but uh, it was really fun. And what we do is that we come one day, we paint with the community, and the next day uh, we come with my team, uh, we fix uh, the mural and we finish it together. And this mural especially, it was really nice because the, uh, when we were working only with my team the next day, uh, some of the kids that painted the previous day came with their families and came with their friends to show them what they have done, you know, and they were, they were say, telling them, this is the mural I, I did, you know, this is the mural I helped with. And when they were seeing the result, they, they felt really proud because it was their mural, you know, they were part of the mural and they were showing everybody. So it creates this sense of accomplishment, you know, and my team leaves the community and uh, sometimes never comes back. So it's not our mural, you know, it's the community's mural. And uh, they feel really proud about it. And there's something about murals that uplifts uh, a community. Uh, we work in sometimes in red areas, in dangerous areas. Uh, this we did in Guatemala and it was a, um, a little dangerous area. 
And we did it uh, with a group of around 20 people, kids, uh, women, and, and, and children. Um, this was a mural about, I think it was 50 meters long. And we usually all, uh, put quotes or uh, letters, something that can uh, tell people what the mural is about. Because, you know, sometimes uh, if you do a mural that has a theme, sometimes people don't understand it because, of course, art is subjective. So when you put a quote, you know, it's a little more like a billboard. So you're telling people, um, you know, something positive. So if you're walking through a, through, a, through a dangerous street and then you see something colorful, something that has something positive, it uplifts you. It changes the way you see the street. It changes the way you see your day. Uh, you see the community. So I think murals, art mur in murals in communities is really important. Uh, this is the last one. Uh, we did it this last year and this was a festival uh, also in a little dangerous area in Guatemala. And we did 10 murals around the community. We did it with artists. So every mural uh, was done by a Guatemalan artist. Uh, we had one by a Mexican artist also. And the beautiful thing about this festival was that uh, we focused on women in history. So all the murals have a quote by, said by a, a woman that, that has changed history. So when you pass through that community, people look for the murals now. And it's a different look, the community. It's still a dangerous community, of course, but people from outside the community start seeing the community in a different way because now it has colors. Now the houses are painted in a different way. And you can see that house, you know, the roof is almost falling, the wood is very old, but now it has color in it, you know, and before it didn't. So murals is a very important way uh, to share art in a community, I think. So we're gonna do another activity now, just to finish. And this is a several a part, an activity that has different parts. So you're gonna need maybe four or five sheets of paper. And the name of this activity, I named it, where do you stand, what do you see? We're gonna have a series of, of photographs and we're gonna draw them. I'm gonna give you time. So you have to be ready with your pen, pencil, whatever you have and a sheet of paper, okay? And I'm gonna put a photo. And for the first photo, we're gonna have five seconds. Okay, so you have to do it fast. And let me put my timer. So be ready, because this is just five seconds. Really fast one. Okay. If you're ready, I'm gonna put the photo on the timer. Hope you're ready. This is the first photo. Start drawing now. Ooh. Okay, finished. Okay. Well, I didn't even have time to do anything. I kind of ended up with this. <laughs> Nothing at all. So, okay, this is the same with problems sometimes. Sometimes we have to think, you know, on the spot, something arrives and we have to think really quickly. And we're like, where do I start? What do I do? Okay, it's the same with art sometimes. So this is really nice examples. So you can see life in a different way. I'm gonna give you uh, 15, 15 seconds now to do the same photo. And it's really nice to see um, a really good tip to draw these photos if we can draw them, if we have to draw them fast, is to see the big picture first. So we'll start with the outline and then do the details, okay? If you have time. So we're gonna do 15 seconds for this one again. So start now. Time. Okay. So this is what I did in this one, a little better. <laughs> Good, Jen Jay. I can see Ravas also. I can see Catherine's. Oh, Catherine, you, you were fast. <laughs> you were ready this time. Good. 
I started a little earlier. I confess. I'm going to wait this time. <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> okay. So you can see now when we have more time to see something, you know, we can see it in a different way as well. Okay. So time is also important when we address problems, when we address life. We sometimes we have to think on the spot. Sometimes we have a little bit more time, or we can see the problem again, you know, and we will see something different the second time. Okay. So we're going to do another photo, and this one is 20 seconds. Uh, let me put the timer. You cannot cheat now because I haven't put the photo yet. <laughs> okay. If you're ready now. Time. Okay. So we could do a little bit more. <laughs> good. <laughs> Very good, Andrew. Young Yeah. So when we have a little bit more time, we can do a little bit more, right? We can see more things. I'm gonna do the next one. Is gonna be. I'm gonna give you 40 seconds now. And this one is an easier photo. So we start now. Time. Okay, so now we have an almost finished one. Is we we had double the time. Good, and it was an easier photo as well. But we could do details. You know, we could see that there's trees. We could see that there's you know lines in the mountains. We could see more of the details now because we had more time, and also because the photo was a little bit easier. So sometimes we're in life, we're going to be, you know, we're going to encounter different kinds of problems, different kinds of things. So the way we address each one is different. But, you know, like in this uh, exercise, if we start seeing the big picture, sometimes it's easier. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's easier to see the little things and then go from the details to the outside. It depends on each person, right? Subjective. <laughs> And we're gonna do the last one right now and we're gonna do a minute. So we'll see what you do with a minute now. 20 more seconds. Give me one second, put the timer. Okay, and start. Time. Okay. And I have this one. Good. <laughs> oh, I like yours, Catherine. Very nice. 
Very nice. Jam DJ. Cool. So this we had a little bit more time. And we're gonna do this once more, we could, but we're gonna have less time and we're gonna have another challenge. So with this one, you had a little bit more time to explore the photo. So you know what it is, you know uh, how to draw it, you know that there's a lot of leaves, that the, there's, you know, how many um, palm trees there are, you have explored it a little bit more, right? But then there's a challenge that you have to address. I'm gonna put 20 seconds. Let's give you 30, 30 seconds. And the extra challenge we're gonna have now is that you cannot lift the pen off the paper, okay? And I'm not there with you. So if you're cheating, I won't see it. So, <laughs> you know, just don't lift the pen off of the paper. Try to do just one line drawing and let's see how it's, how it's done. Let's start now. Time. Okay, my timer didn't sound, but it was time. Good. <laughs> so it, this was my first one and this was my second one. So because I saw it first, you know, because we did it the first time and we had one minute to explore how it was, the second time that we came just a little challenge, a little different, we could draw a little faster as well, okay? So sometimes, you know, we, we're gonna address the problem twice or three times or four times, but with a little change. So the way we address things, the way we address problems in our life is kind of the way we can address, we address art, you know, is we just have to see it in a different way. So I'm gonna end um, my presentation with this quote that has to do with this exercise that we just did. So if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change, okay? So just step out, you know, step out of where you are and see things in a different way. It's like when, we, um, when we're seeing something, we're seeing a tree and there's like three people around the tree seeing the same tree, the same tree, those people are not gonna see the tree in the same way because they're standing in a different side of the tree. You know, it's the same with problems. Just change the way you see things and everything will change. You know, sometimes solutions will arrive if you just change that vision, okay? And yeah, that, this is where I want to arrive. And if you use art as a way of helping you through life, through problems, or if you see, uh, if you do this kind of exercise in your organizations, in your family, wherever you are, uh, I think we can make uh, people understand that we can address problems in a different way. We can address conflict in a different way and life in a different way, okay? And this is the way I am. So thank you very much. I hope it helped. Thank you, Bara. Absolutely uplifted, uplifted. And you know, sometimes peace does pass through the hands. There is some action <laughs> that is involved. So to be active and, and to be part of the art practice together today has been has been lovely. Thank you. So, and there will be questions. <laughs> I'm going to continue now to our last panelist before we have a short musical break. And I'd like to introduce uh, Sakura Saunders. She's a member of World Beyond War. She sits on the board. She's an environmental justice organizer. organizer Indigenous solidarity activist, arts educator, and media producer. She's a co-founder of the Mining and Justice Solidarity Network and a member of the Beehive Design Collective. She currently resides in Halifax, so I think she spends a lot of time not really residing, but being active, doing the work on the street from 
Africville to stop oil and gas, you'll find Sakura, and and we follow her, and we we are in her wake, <laughs> supporting her. So um, I would like to uh, invite her now to give us her presentation. Thank you, Sakura. Thank you so much, Catherine, um, and thanks to all the participants or the panelists so far. It's been a great to listen to you and participate in your activity. So um, I'm going to share my screen and do a presentation. I'm setting a timer. Um, I doubt I'm going to have time to um, make it through my entire presentation, which is totally fine. Um, but we'll get as far as we can. OK, so hopefully you all can see that. So um, I'm part of the Beehive Design Collective, and we are a wildly motivated all-volunteer activist art collective dedicated to cross-pollinating the grassroots by creating collaborative anti-copyright images for use as educational and organizing tools. We work as word to image translators of complex global stories shared with us through conversations with affected communities. And so I'm reminded of a presentation earlier, <clears throat> excuse me. And so art for us is a medium of education. And um, we have many different types of workshops that we do. Some are uh, picture storytelling um, and, you know, kind of referencing the last pre presenter, that is to teach people complex global issues so that they remember, uh, but we also do more collaborative um, art trainings and things like that. And that's where we teach people kind of our techniques for creating these images. And the Beehive Collective has many, um, um, oh, there we go, many, uh, iterations around the globe. So in Colombia, uh, our our Beehive Collective member there, uh, he uh, embeds himself in various movements and does things uh, that engage, uh, in particular, the youth um, in things like mural creation and things like that as a, as a component of resistance and social movements. So trying to flip, there we go. Ah. Um, so this is one of the examples of um, a graphic narrative piece. It's um, the first one that we did and where we discovered um, art as a very effective tool for um, education and popular education. Um, it's up around the free trade area of the Americas and oops, I'm having a hard time, sorry about this, um, controlling this PowerPoint, but um, and it's uh, metaphorically represents um, the impacts of free trade deals. And so what we have in the middle is these three spiders that represent the three forces of globalization. Um, at the top left, we see industrial development. Um, over to the left, we see, or sorry, over to the right, we see um, media um, and that kind of technology. And then at the bottom, uh, there's the spider representing militarization as these kind of three forces of globalization. And then stuck in the web um, are all these different animals that represent different groups of people. So this is a sheep <laughs> representing a student. Um, and you can see there's a carrot on the stick on its graduation cap. And it is locked in these chains of debt. Um, and so it's just representing one of the groups of people, particularly students, that are negatively impacted by these free, so-called free trade deals. Um, the resistance represented in this graphic um, was these ants along the bottom of the, of the page, and they were like protesters, lots of them had puppets and things like that. Um, but we were actually criticized a bit for kind of illustrating the resistance as merely participants in a protest, um, even though um, that is definitely a part of it. And so for our next piece, um, it was about Plan Colombia or U.S. foreign policy towards Colombia, uh, talking about the billions of dollars of military aid um, that the U.S. gives to Colombia um, that then uses it um, in an internal conflict and also against its own people. Um, so here uh, we started with a three month tour of Colombia and also Ecuador, which is impacted by the militarism in Colombia. And because 
uh, we based it on these kind of interviews with people that are directly living the impacts of US foreign policy. Um, the story we were able to tell was much deeper, um, especially in terms of the resistance. And so we can see um, these two wasp nests, the top one is shaped like Europe, um, and then growing out of the base, like in nature, using a nature metaphor, when a wasp nest is exhausted of resources, a new wasp nest will emerge from the base of the previous one. And there we have this new wasp nest kind of shaped like the United States. Uh, the larva represents the consumption of the United States because when we ask people how they wanted US policy represented and why they thought that the US had this foreign policy, uh, they often blamed the consumptive lifestyles of Americans. Um, they're each kind of isolated in cells, um, relating to the world and reality through screens. Um, and so here we're kind of tracing the root of this issue all the way back to you know 500 years to colonization. And also when we talked about the resistance, we didn't just talk about all the horrible things, but we also talked about, sorry. Um, we also talked about what people are trying to protect, right? Um, so not just uh, what's bad, which you kind of see where these leaf cutter ants have made their biggest cut. Um, the top half is talking about kind of this colonized world, you know, where for example, um, you can see there's this mama that's creating um, coca tea for her young one with altitude sickness, you know, coca regarded as a, as a medicine. We're on the kind of colonized side of that. The coca leaves are turning into dollar bills and um, right here. And uh, the coca plant is being combined with chemicals to create cocaine for export to the US. And of course, this is the um, justification for this military aid is to fight the drug war. And there's all these different examples of, um, you know, the elder t telling stories by the campfire, whereas over here the elder is relegated to changing the channel on the television screen. Um, and this kind of juxtaposition of these two worlds, where the heart of this world is the oil economy. Um, and then what's juxtaposed with that is this word pachakutik, which means earth time. And, um, you know, they were talking about this idea of like cyclical time. Now, the process of always starting our graphics with um, a tour um, started with Plan Columbia. And of course, we've done it for every single graphic since. And so here's some pictures from the tour that we did before doing a piece on mountaintop removal in um, Appalachia, which is um, southeastern part of the United States where there's a lot of coal mining. And so here we would show people pictures of our past graphics and, you know, we would even ask them like what animals would you like to represent them or plants um, and kind of explain our process and hear stories, uh, hear about the biology of the region. Um, and then, you know, in this case, we created a graphic that um, read like a story, like a timeline almost, uh, where we went from the creation of coal in the ancient marshlands of Appalachia up through the colonial history of the region, um, through industrialization, um, the mechanization of coal mining, the replacement of workers by machines, uh, the evolution to current day extreme extraction. Uh, we have mountaintop removal coal mining, which is um, a type of strip mining um, that wholesale destroys the land uh, while employing 90% less people than the underground mines. Uh, but then we also move through different tactics of resistance. Um, and then to the final panel, which is um, the regeneration uh, phase where we highlighted projects that are currently happening in Appalachia um, that are working to restore both the local ecology and the local economy through things like, you know, community gardens and community kitchens and and uh, um, community media projects and seed saving and um, renewable energies and things like that. So um, a big part of our process is um, creating mind maps. And that is how we eventually map the concepts to um, the pages. So for the previous graphic that I showed you about um, coal mining in Appalachia, 
Um, that was much more of a storyboard because we had a, a certain timeline to it, uh, but not all of our graphics are as straightforward. So this is a mind map uh, that we used for um, the Plan Panama project, which eventually was called Mesoamerica Resiste. And um, it is a two-sided graphic. And uh, this side is what we call a top-down view of the world. And the idea here is that from this vantage point, all you can see of Mesoamerica, which is Southern Mexico and Central America, are the large scale infrastructure projects planned for the region. Uh, dams, pipelines, highways, airports, energy grids, um, and factory zones. And its resistance to these projects was a theme of the overall piece. This project took nine years to create and started with a six month tour of the region, um, as well as uh, constant communication with the communities we were in contact with uh, during that nine year process. And um, the overall design um, is in the style of an old world map um, as an allusion to colonialism, um, but the map also served as an economic snapshot of the region where all the boats represented various exports both historic and contemporary you know, imports and exports. So here, for example, we have um, the sugar boat, the gold boat, and the slave boat to represent the triangular trade route that drove the colonization of the Americas. Um, you know, we have modern industries also represented here with the Canadian flag, of course, is the mining industry because um, the vast majority of the world's mining um, companies um, are headquartered in Canada. So in the four corners, we have um, different winds, different storms that represent uh, systemic economic pressures acting on the region. So from the north, we had the storm cloud of militarization, pesticides, culture, um, and technology. Whereas in the south, um, we have a hurricane brewing. Um, a natural disaster caused by climate change, war, economic and industrial displacement uh, is causing a wave of migration north. Uh, from Asia, we have the manufacturing cloud bringing in these parts to be assembled in the factory zones of Mesoamerica to be sucked up by the consumer tornado to bring to markets in North America and Europe. And, and notice that uh, we tended to highlight um, disposable items, uh, whether single use products or um, technological product products that are doomed to fill our landfills um, and e-waste stockpiles, such as like, you know, last year's Blackberry phone or televisions and things like that. In the four corners are four different global institutions um, that enable this kind of development. And uh, they are all drawn to kind of metaphorically uh, symbolize the institution that we're illustrating. So the International Monetary Fund is the um, uh, faceless surgeon, you know, performing reconstructive surgery on a battered looking body of Mesoamerica, you know, applying leeches, extracting resources with their three pronged syringe. Um, you know, and, and so the IMF is of course prescribing structural adjustment um, in exchange for debt relief. And of course, the surgeon has a knot in their stethoscope to show that it is definitely not listening to the hearts of the people it's impacting on the ground in Mesoamerica. And then finally, just on the sides, we have these Mobius strips that represent vi vicious dynamics. Um, and so here we have violence against people. And then on the flip side of that, of course, is, is mass resistance. And here, this tractor, um, tank trailer is kind of representing the intersection of agriculture and militarism and talking about violence against the land as well. Um, and the Trojan horse, of course, representing the Trojan horse of all solutions to climate change. Um, in this case, we're highlighting the impacts of um, uh, at, um, agri-fuels and, um, you know, and the various impacts that those agrofuels are having um, on uh, farming and land use in Mesoamerica. 
Uh, again, responding to the criticism that we, you know, sh illustrate what's bad, <laughs> but don't illustrate necessarily all the wonderful things uh, that people are trying to protect and preserve. Uh, so we made the inside, which is the um, view from below, twice as big. Um, where in the corner, there's a Saba tree representing the um, tree of life and spiraling around it like DNA strands are the streams of winged and water creatures. Uh, these are the spirit animals to represent uh, the presence of ancestors uh, because that was one thing that the communities um, asked of us um, again and again independently of one another throughout the six months was that if we were going to illustrate their stories, we had to have the ancestors present day. And so we have them throughout the piece. Um, these ants, um, you know, representing, interestingly enough, the Zapatistas, which um, I know, um, I think that the art itself is a form of nonviolent resistance. Not all of the movements we um, highlight are pacifist movements. Um, and so these ants are carrying the blades of grass that have the Zapatista principles of organizing written on them. Um, but they do have a pr principle of um, being very anti-oppressive. Um, and so, um, you know, they exercise power, they don't take power. And so that kind of um, references this Zapatista ethic of, you know, uh, they, did, they did declare war, um, but they did it to get peace. It was their actual strategy to have um, all of their supporters kind of rise up and demand that the government sign peace accords with them. And so, um, you know, in their own words, they have weapons that aspire not to be used. And so, um, you know, they, the government signed but never ratified the peace agreement, but they have lived by that uh, peace agreement since 1994. Um, and, you know, they simply want to be left alone and have their autonomy from the Mexican government. Um, I'm kind of speeding through because I'm close to the 17 minute mark of my presentation. Um, just to let you know about the, um, again, the format of this piece. Um, on the edges of the graphic, we see these scenes of, of res, um, community and they're being invaded all, all along the edges of the graphic. And so here we have um, a traditional market scene. And you know what you probably wouldn't notice if I didn't tell you is that all of the merchants are pollinators and all of the customers are seed dispersers. And so this metaphor of pollination and seed dispersion is a metaphor for the role um, in an ecology of the traditional market, right? The buying and selling of organic food and seeds. But this, and the strength of this market is being represented by this DNA, right? Or the biodiversity that it helps preserve. Um, but then here we have these shopping carts filled with uh, monocultures of uh, palm, um, GMO soy and GMO corn. Um, and each shopping cart's filled with those products associated with those monocrops. And over here, um, we have the women on the front lines of resistance. And so this is another way that um, our, our graphic does highlight and support um, nonviolent tactics. And it's a you know, common tactic of um, this, the women on the front lines, you know, to, to have the women go to the front lines and stand you know, in between uh, the police or the whatever you know, militarized you know, entity is there um, to kind of de-escalate that violence. And um, you can see here, for example, um, this is taken from a very famous image. Um, and this is um, in the community of Abejas. And what basically happened was there was a massacre here after the Zapatista uprising. Uh, they were a pacifist community, uh, but they supported the Zapatistas. Um, you know, morally supported the Zapatistas. And I think because they were an easier target because they were um, explicitly pacifist, they were attacked and massacred. And so um, this is a very famous image of the women um, like physically pushing uh, the military out of their community. And, you know, it just shows this, the power of this like 
dignified resistance, you know, the women unarmed um, pushing out these soldiers. So um, we take um, these graphics and we usually do two hour presentations, not 20 minute presentations. So I skipped over a lot of things, um, but we, use these to talk to people about these issues, to talk to people about globalization, uh, to talk to about, about the role of um, Western or Northern, you know, um, institution, Northern institutions um, and the role of wherever we're at um, in contributing to these. Uh, we also distribute, um, you know, 50% of our print run um, to communities in the places that are impacted by uh, these issues so that they can distribute them, um, you know, as fundraisers or for free as educational tools. And I just wanted to show this last thing is that um, we also use um, or have used, I should say, um, in various um, uh, presentations and workshops, um, the kind of map of Mesoamerica resistance or Mesoamerica resiste um, to, to relate it to other situations. And so here, this was taken from a presentation I did in Detroit, where um, they wanted to use Mesoamerica Resiste as a map to talk about um, the issues that they were facing. You know, and so we uh, filled it out um, and talked about what the corresponding institutions or dynamics or pressures uh, would be as related to a Detroit context. And then we had the big 20 foot banner of the inside of the graphic and we labeled each section. Um, you know, for example, the birthing scene in Mesoamerica Resiste became, um, we labeled that health. And then we had people use sticky notes and uh, put all of the different, um, types of individual actions or organizations active in the community um, that are working to promote health. Um, and so that's just one of the ways that we can use it in a more interactive way, use our artwork to engage people in understanding uh, the issues in their own communities. And I think I actually made it through, which is great, um, to the end uh, where I just wanted to highlight the work of um, our B, Jonathan Luna and his team in Colombia and um, talk about how, you know, basically his, he's from Colombia and he started touring Colombia with our Plan Colombia graphic and then later Mesoamerica Resiste and how that project has evolved into a more long-term work um, with, you know, a discrete number of communities um, working to engage in particular the youth, uh, but to um, be a part of the resistance by engaging people in collaborative art making, collaborative mural making, um, and really, you know, kind of bottom lining that aspect of resistance in those communities, as, at least as a facilitator. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, oh my gosh, was I, I think I was cutting off my mouth the entire time. I, was, I couldn't see the screen um, <laughs> while I was doing my presentation. It was 100% beautiful, Sakura. <laughs> no worries about that at all. I think, uh, I just wish that before any political decisions were made and you know, our, our, our governments, they would be, have to sit down to this process and be part of it and, uh, and do some anti-oppression work, <laughs> but much more, I have much more to say, but I will stop there. So many thoughts racing around and uh, thank you so much, Sakura. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry about the time pressure. I think we'd all be willing to spend the rest of the day with you, <laughs> with all of you, but um, maybe we will take just a little five minute. Uh, Jenna Jay, how long is the film? I'd really like, uh, the opportunity to have the uh, the film played, if that was the plan or whatever you had in mind. Um, I can play the music video that's four and a half minutes. Or if we are running short in time because we are touching 8.30, then we can go into the uh, Q&A. 
Let's let's take a short break, just even to stretch. So if you could run the video, then we'll be back in three or four minutes and for the Q&A. Sure. Does uh, that work for everyone? So uh, I'd like to request our friends, uh, both in the panel and the attendee list, to put in the questions in the chat if you have any questions for any of the panelists or the other people hiding up here. So, Jay Jagat, I'll just play something for a short five minute break. And see you in three minutes or four. <laughs> But in Armenian way, we should say.
Thank you. Handing session back to Catherine now. Thank you very much, Janma J. The winds of peace. And we're coming up to the anniversary of the when the march was stopped. Amazing. So here we are back and welcome back again. Um, so much to think about. I am going to hand over this part of the Q&A to Annie Luke. And if there are any questions at all, please put them into the chat and take it away, Annie. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you to all the presenters for wonderful, wonderful presentations and just a short glimpse into the amazing work that is going on around the world. Thank you. Um, I think I've been looking at the comments in the chat and it's just, I can see that you've all ignited something in everyone. Um, so I am going to be the questioner. So the first question I'm going to just go, uh, is for all four of you. And so the question is, how do you think about the practice of courage in relation to your art practice? So let's start with, um, I'm gonna go through this, the order of the presentation. So Jama Jay, why don't you start? How do you think the practice, how do you think about the practice of courage in relation to your art practice? Um, I think first you start by acknowledging reality and then you start feeling terrified because you realize that very soon, maybe in your own lifetime, the planet might start becoming something that's a problem to live in. And for a lot of people, it already is a problem to live in. So you start hanging out with them and you start learning from the courage of the people who are facing that reality. You start uh, spending time with the people who are facing the consequences of climate change uh, farmers whose crops are suffering because there's odd rain happening. That's been happening this year. Uh, there was a lot of loss of crop in uh, Madhya Pradesh, the place where I am, because the rains would come as a torrent and then they would just stop. So a lot of crops got destroyed because of this very existing problem. Then we had, you know, plagues out of the Bible coming into our fields. So, um, I think courage is something you learn as an essential skill of survival. Sometimes you take your own, sometimes you borrow from others. But I think you learn courage through collaboration and through uh, working with everyone. Thank you, Jamu Jay. Secret? That's a wonderful answer. I, for me, I mean, I think if I were to relate it to my practice of art, I think every every time you put or you create or you enact an artistic expression is an act of courage um, because it goes back down to who you are and change first begins within yourself. Um, and so art is such a beautiful medium through which you can express the courage, whether you're aware of it or not, um, in in hoping and acting for social change and transformation. Um, and myself, I, as I think I mentioned in my presentation, I it took me a long time to consider myself an artist, even though I've been creating things since I could remember myself. Um, but I think to take ownership of what you do and the way you think and the way you want to help. Um, and the way you see social change is definitely an act of courage. Um, and that sort of spills over into your community and to the people you interact with. And um, one can only hope the larger um, community, the global community. Um, but in any case, I think courage starts within the individual. And it's not in isolation, but it, it does have to you do have to take sort of ownership of, of the fact that you want change. Um, and art to me is, again, is, is an embodiment of that courage. Thank you, Sigrid. Bara? Okay, I actually have a workshop that talks about this, not courage, but I address it through fear. We talk about fear and how to address fear. And I really like the quote that says that courage is 
uh, not the lack of fear, but having fear and doing things anyway. Uh, so in this workshop uh, with my students, you know, I have students that think that they cannot draw or I get students sometimes that they think they are too old to start um, drawing or painting. And we address this, you know, we address fears, how uh, through art, uh, you can see that uh, you can do anything, you know, you just have to take the first step. So taking the first step is the beginning, you know, you have to be courageous for that. So yeah, that's, that's how I address it. Thanks, Para. Sakura. Yes, well, I mean, first I have to, you know, agree with what's already been said, you know, um, especially about like, you know, just being inspired by the courage of others and be, that being a huge inspiration for us in terms of the communities that, you know, we are representing their stories. And, um, uh, but I would say that, yeah, anytime that you put yourself out there, it takes a lot of courage. And, um, you know, our, our group is actually, I would say only 50% uh, people who self-identify as artists. Um, so a lot of people in the group are educators, storytellers, activists, organizers, you know, um, and so there's a bit of, and we, and we do the artwork anonymously. So we don't say who drew what, um, and that can create some, uh, a little bit of imposter syndrome, I guess, and some people, especially like the newer bees that are doing these presentations. And also, you know, anytime like an active, any activist, you know, you're going to be attacked for putting your views out there. It just like comes with the territory, um, you know, from your own people, it, as well as from the right. And so we just really try to approach it with humility and, you know, kind of thanking people who have criticized our art um, and trying to kind of incorporate the criticisms into our presentation um, to show how we've addressed them. Um, you know, we never present ourselves as the experts on anything. We really try to, you know, um, with every graphic, ask the audience to participate or to interpret it um, as well, which is why the presentations last, you know, two hours <laughs> as opposed to 20 minutes. But, um, you know, so we try to kind of, uh, you know, I guess a way of dealing with, with the fear related to putting yourself out there is just to approach it with humility. Okay, this is my kid, so I'm gonna mute myself. And that's the end of my question. Answer. Thanks, Sakura. That's fantastic. It's all sharing the stage with everybody else, right? Um, so the next questions, um, I have one question for each of the panelists or each of the presenters. So Jam and Jay, I'm gonna start with you first. Um, can you talk about how your art has affected your experience as a marcher? Um, and also how has your experience as a marcher affected your art? Mm, sure. So I think um, for one, I have been humbled uh, by the process of being given the opportunity to tell the story of all these amazing people. Because uh, the beauty of working with you know, a Gandhian organization like Jai Jagat uh, is that you encounter people that you admire intensely and working with them, spending time with them makes you realize that uh, it opens up your mind quite a bit. So that transforms you and you realize that that transformation is necessary to do justice to uh, the stories that you want to tell about them. So the art and the artist need to be at the same wavelength of sorts. So I think that has been uh, one of the key things. The other thing I realized is the value of internal and external transformation. So like while we were marching, we would have prayers in the evening every day. And we would have Raja Ji who would come and start the prayer and everybody else would join in. And when he was not there, you know, somebody or the other would just start the prayer in the evening. And you realize that uh, in that time, you build this community and you start trusting these people implicitly. So that's the beauty of a give and take relationship in this sort of, a, you know, creation of art and being a part of the creation itself. Thanks, Chamaji. Um, Sigurd. The question for you is, what do you see as the difference between creating art and observing art as a connection to peace? That's a good question. I think, 
Well, first of all, even people who create art will observe art. Um, so looking at art and um, just sort of, I guess, observing, observing art is, is intrinsic to all of us, whether we do it um, in a conscious way or not, especially as I mentioned in my presentation, sort of in this day and age where you're bombarded with all these sort of visuals created uh, by various people and the various messages. Um, in terms of peace, I think they both have, both actions and both practices um, have potential for peace. Um, first of all, let's start with observing, which has kind of been sort of the theme of my presentation. Um, as a consumer of art and an observer of art, just the action of understanding the kind of messages that you are given um, and how you understand and react to them in itself is quite inducive to more peaceful uh, approaches, right? Um, if you uncritically absorb messages, uh, for example, of war, you wouldn't be able to necessarily distill how you can then react in a peaceful way. Um, and we know from past, uh, our dark past, that there have been things like propaganda that have been very powerful in giving those messages uh, in a way that are consumed to produce a violent um, consequence, uh, consequences. As to a creative of art, uh, I do think that um, for the better or the worse, the art that you put out there is not just yours. So once it's out there, it is everyone's. Um, that being said, the way you produce the artwork and the message that you initially intend, I do think that it has um, it has reminiscence into how it is received by everyone else. So even though there will always be people who interpret it or misinterpret or put different interpretations or use it for ways that you didn't necessarily intend to, um, as an artist or creative of art, um, you can put something that represents something that's important to you and that can be a peaceful thing. And I don't know if that's necessarily a straightforward uh, answer, but if I were to sum it up, I would say that as, as a creator of art, you can affect change by the way you put your out, out there, the way you hold yourself with your art, the messages that you intend to, uh, regardless of the fact that it is everyone's art and it will be interpreted in different ways. Thank you, Sigrid. Um, Bara? Can you talk a little bit more about how the process of creating the murals as a way to promote peace and social justice and social change in the communities that you work with? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, we usually, well, we work, I work with a team. So we think about a theme or a subject to address through the murals. So they'll have to do with um, most of the time with empowerment. I work a lot with women empowerment I think that's uh, one of the ways to uh, arrive to peace, you know, to empower women all over the world. So uh, when we have the subject, the theme, then we start designing the murals. Like in the last festival that we did, that was, um, we talked about uh, women in history. Uh, we um, uh, made a call for artists and they presented their designs, their quotes, the quotes they wanted to work with, the women, uh, they were representing and the designs. And then the team um, uh, curated the murals. So we received around maybe a hundred submissions. And then we chose, we chose 20, but 10 were international. And because, because of COVID, they couldn't come to Guatemala. So then we had to choose 10. Um, we arrived to 10 and then uh, we looked for sponsors that could um, help us with the paint. Uh, with the food for the artist, with the tools and everything. And then uh, we did the murals with the community. Oh, and we also had to work with the community because we needed houses to paint on, right? <laughs> so these are all private houses. So we had to go and knock on doors and, and see um, who would like for us to paint a mural there. And some of the times we, you know, we had to say these murals might not end up as you're seeing the sketch. Uh, and they, they, some didn't agree, some agreed. So it, it's a hard and long process, you know, you have to do 
uh, a series of things, talk to the municipalities, uh, to the neighbors, uh, to the people around you, to the artists to agree on certain days to paint so we can all paint together. So uh, it took us around uh, maybe six months and then because of COVID, we delayed it another six months, so a year to, to do the festival. So long process. <laughs> but I guess the process itself is bringing people together who might not have thought about peace and social change, you know, much in their lives if you're just approaching a homeowner or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to tell them about the, uh, what the murals are about. So uh, it, it was really interesting because we did it in a... Um, a uh, very traditional area in Guatemala, the festival. So it, we're talking about women empowerment and then we knock on the door. Uh, most of the time a woman would open the door and they would tell us, oh, I have to ask my husband if he agrees. So it was really interesting because we were talking about empowerment and then, uh, you know, doing this. So uh, it, the, all, the process is really interesting and you can see the change as well when we finish in the neighbors, you know, they're uh, they're happy to see uh, the walls, they, they're uplifted, and the women also, they, they come and talk to us, and, and you start seeing empowerment because all the, all the murals were painted by women as well. So just seeing that, you know, women in the community, seeing that we were, women were painting the murals, it's, you know, it starts there, just by example. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Mara. Um, our last question is for Sakura. Um, there's been a fair amount of interest in trying to access the, um, the images for people's use in their classrooms. So I think you've already told some people that they can check out beehivecollective.org. Um, Sakura, I was just wondering if you could talk about some of the reactions that you've seen um, from the communities that you've worked with after working on these pieces for so long when you take the artwork back to the communities that you work with, what are some of the reactions that you've seen? And also like, what kind of reactions do you usually get from general viewers um, from this artwork? Okay, so um, I used to tease that if you gave me an hour in the Mesoamerica Resist State poster, I could turn anyone into an anti-capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I think it's great when um, I'm showing it to people and even detractors, you know, are just like, oh, like, I don't agree with your politics, but tell me more, you know, um, and because so many of the, um, you know, we, we, there's a lot of analysis in Mesoamerica Resisti. It's like a very, very analysis heavy first in terms of discussing like the institutions and what is the WTO and NAFTA and CAFTA, and, you know, all that stuff. And then, um, but then as you go deeper into it, it's more storytelling. And so we're telling stories that the communities have experienced that have been told to us. And that's so grounded, you know, that people who are detractors, they might think it's very easy to dismiss your analysis, but then when they hear actual stories, you know, or when you tell it in a more storytelling format, um, it, it just, it's, it's a bit more trans, Formative, you know, and um, so I always, I always love that, that like, you know, people that start, you know, and they're just interested in decoding the artwork because they like the art and they think the interpretations are clever, you know, but though they would never call themselves an anti-capitalist near the end, they're just like, oh my God, you know? Um, and so that's really great. And the fact that it, it allows us to get into places like art galleries and, you know, <laughs> it, 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 you know, we're not just like doing presentation in various Marxist classes and things like that. Um, in now, in terms of bringing it to places, you know, where the images are from, you know, definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's just beautiful to see people use it as like an education format, you know, I mean, to see it used in classrooms. Um, I remember, I actually spent a few weeks with um, in a Zapatista caracol in um, in Mexico, in Chiapas. And when I went my first time going into the Junta de Bien Gobierno and seeing our graphic in the office of the Junta, you know, it was such an honor. I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> You know, you guys will like, you know, we really like admire like what you've been able to do in terms of establishing autonomy um, and 
you know, and then to see them do that. And we would just, um, we would go uh, for a, f a few years, um, we would go and just go to their New Year's celebration. Um, and we would just hand them out and, you know, everyone loved them, you know, we just hand them out like candy. Um, and so, yeah, I even saw somebody that had the um, assembly scene from the Mesoamerica Resiste poster. They had it tattooed on their stomach, the entire scene. I was just like, damn, you get a free poster. <laughs> um, you know, so definitely people have uh, reacted well to it. I mean, uh, there's a need for training, you know, and there still is um, so that they can, you know, because they, they, we do have like a, a big banner down there as well. Um, and, you know, and, and then they use it and they, you know, sell it for fundraisers. And, um, you know, it's great to see, it's great to see a tool being used uh, for multiple purposes, education, fundraising, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as a collective, we're kind of falling apart right now a little bit as a collective. Uh, I have to admit, we've been around for like 20 years and that happens with all volunteer collectives. But, um, you know, we used to tease that we printed our own money uh, because basically as long as you were on the road, you could sell posters and then you could kind of indefinitely be on the road doing this kind of education work and, and seeing communities. And so I've toured, you know, the US multiple times, Canada, probably seven or eight times doing presentations, um, you know, every three hours, you know, driving across the entire country and it just pays for itself, which is great. I guess it speaks to the aesthetics that, you know, just the, the intricate details just attract the eyes and then you just that's a great way to draw people into a conversation like you said you know if it's just your traditional speech people might not be attracted to participate in it but it's a great way to draw people in thank you yeah and on a nice day you can throw it up in any park and just get total <laughs> random right. total <laughs> random to come up and talk to you about capitalism <laughs> You know, Absolutely. before I join the beehives, you know, I would love to rant at people about capitalism for as long as they would let me, but you know, it's it's actually pretty difficult to find people willing to talk to you about capitalism for a half hour. That's right, <laughs> but people would just stare at, at, at you know, the artwork for hours and just trying to decipher what's going on, right? So, yeah, that's amazing. Thanks, Akura. Thank you again for all the pre to all the presenters for just this fantastic morning or afternoon, evening, I don't know where depending on where you are. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to uh, Catherine and Reva to make some closing remarks. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you in a thousand ways, but I'm going to go back to the poster and to Anna, the Arif's student from Alberta. And on her poster, she said, what peace means, cheer people up, feel nice, calm inside, show love to your family, share it to people that doesn't have it and invite people to play. So thank you for taking the invitation today and being part of this panel, not only to play, but uh, for all you've shared. Thank you. And now Reva has closing remarks and I hope to see all of you again. <laughs> Well, I just uh, want to start by saying thank you again. I mean, I think what I learned through this whole process was uh, several things from John Majay, the power of documenting, from Sigrid, the the whole notion of how do we um, how do we really think. Uh, about deconstructing images and, and how important that is in this work for peace. From Bara to find a way to release our imaginations. And um, from Sakura so much in all of that detail, but really had to tell and retell complex stories. Um, I wanna thank Catherine so much for putting this together. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's been here with us today. Um, and I am uh, also wanting to uh, uh, give you just two pieces of information. Uh, one, I don't know if Rhea's got the, uh, uh, the slide up for me or not, but- uh, Yes, I'm yes. just pleasant. Just, just trying. Okay, um, today is, as Catherine said at the outset, the first day of the season for nonviolence. And um, 
each day of this season is, uh, uh, is, is dedicated to highlighting a different practice of nonviolence. And that question about courage at the outset was from me uh, because I wanted uh, to uh, highlight the fact that today is the, the practice uh, that is highlighted on the first day of the season for nonviolence is courage. And Ria, if you could go to the second to the second slide, that's the one that I wanted, um, that I wanted to let everybody know that as the season goes on each day, um, there's a different uh, practice that's highlighted. And, and uh, if you uh, look at the website for the Gandhi Foundation, uh, the Mahatma Gandhi Canadian Foundation, and it's there. Um, that you can get information about what is uh, the the practice that's being highlighted and some ideas for activities that you can take up with with young children with youth and with adults um, and then the thank you for that Ria and the last thing that I want to highlight is that our next session will actually be part two of our uh, webinars on the arts. And uh, our dear Shana Kumar is uh, doing the uh, organizing for that one. And the session is called Radical Movement. And in that session, which will be on March 7th at this same time or close to it, there will be three distinct things that will be uh, part of the session. One is Indigenous theatre and colonization. The second is embodied leadership. And the third is dance activism. So I really encourage you to come join us on March 7th uh, for that session. And there will be some uh, information going out. And in the meantime, thank you all again so very much for being part of Educating for Justice Through Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Jagat. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye